Every year, thousands of people mysteriously vanish without a trace, leaving behind a chilling void of unanswered questions and unfulfilled hopes. One such disappearance that has sparked intrigue and an unyielding quest for truth is the case of Michael Bryson. Michael Bryson, a vibrant 27-year-old, vanished into the dense woods of Oregon on August 5, 2020. He was last seen at a camping party in the Hobo Campground in Lane County, and despite extensive search efforts, no trace of him has been found. Before we delve further into the perplexing details of Michael's disappearance, let's take a step back and explore the life of Michael Bryson. Born on January 5, 1993 to Tina and Parrish Bryson, Michael was a self-proclaimed mama's boy, always unashamedly vocal about his deep affection for his mother. Raised alongside his older sister Krista in the Harrisburg Junction City area of Oregon, Michael's childhood was filled with love and normalcy. His parents have been married for over 30 years and provided a stable, nurturing environment for their children. From a young age, Michael showed a passion for cinema. His first theater experience was watching Disney's Pocahontas with his mother, an experience that sparked an enduring love for the big screen. It was this love of movies that saw Michael inviting several kids from youth group to go see a movie for his 14th birthday. On the way, Tina asked what movie they were going to see to which Michael responded that it was called Step Brothers. Tina and Parrish, not knowing what this movie was about, thought this sounded nice. Well, if you've ever seen Step Brothers, you can certainly imagine Tina and Parrish's shock and horror as they sat through this movie with a bunch of kids from church. But that was Michael, always full of surprises. This fascination with films grew with him into adulthood. In fact, it is said that Michael knew the storyline and actors of nearly every film ever made. Michael was also incredibly active and sociable, playing sports, participating in Boy Scouts, and being an active member of his church. As a teenager, he traveled to Mexico with his church to build homes. It wasn't long before he again embarked on another journey, this time traveling to Africa, specifically Liberia. He again traveled back to Africa on another missions trip when he was 19, this time to Kenya. While these experiences left an indelible mark on Michael's soul, they also served as a turning point. Michael witnessed horrific things that would haunt him forever. Despite this, Michael absolutely fell in love with Africa. These journeys changed his perspective on life and formed a dream of someday moving to Africa to continue helping others. In fact, these experiences meant so much to Michael that they inspired his first tattoo, which was of two hands shaking and read, Stay strong, my brothers. In a devastating turn of events, this very tattoo is now one of Michael's identifying features. Michael's deep compassion and empathy for others was both a blessing and a curse as it took a toll on his mental health. He desperately wanted everyone to feel loved and accepted and had an uncanny ability to connect with both people and animals, often bringing a smile to their faces with his playful pranks and infectious laughter. His love for adventure was unparalleled. Whether it was exploring the great outdoors or riding the highest roller coasters, Michael lived life on the edge. As we further delve into the life of Michael Bryson, we begin to uncover a more complex picture. After graduating from high school, Michael went on to attend Northwest Christian University, following in his sister's footsteps. A year into his college life, Michael's friends and family began noticing changes in Michael's demeanor. He had found a new group of friends and more worryingly began to exhibit signs of mental health struggles. Despite suspicion that Michael might be suffering from bipolar disorder, he was never formally diagnosed with this condition. Michael had a pattern of going to initial consultations, but then skipping the follow-up appointments. This made it difficult for any doctor to give him a proper diagnosis or monitor any potential conditions. He was prescribed gabapentin for anxiety and depression. However, like many people, Michael did not like the idea of taking medication. As a result, any time he would start taking a medication, it wasn't long before he would stop. This cycle of starting and stopping medication is a common struggle for many battling mental health issues, and this became Michael's reality. Discontinuing a medication so abruptly can have severe side effects, and this cycle can leave one feeling trapped and hopeless. Battling such internal turmoil can make you feel like you are alone, but Michael certainly is not alone. According to the CDC, one in five adults in the United States struggle with mental illness. This already staggering number is likely much higher, as not all cases are reported. These struggles led Michael down a path that many who struggle with mental health issues find themselves on, self-medication. Michael began to use alcohol and marijuana as coping mechanisms, 
Of course, this is not to say that marijuana does not have benefits when it comes to treating mental health conditions, but it's important to remember that sometimes additional help is needed. This unseen struggle forms a crucial part of understanding the puzzle that is Michael's disappearance. As we peel back the layers of Michael's life, his passion for music becomes evident. He developed a deep love for EDM. It was more than just a hobby. It became an escape, an outlet for his internal struggles. His love for music led to him attending numerous concerts and raves. He even took up DJing, often being invited to play at parties and events across the state. However, this new lifestyle introduced Michael to a darker side of life, heavier drugs. Though he did not develop a full-blown addiction initially, his substance use certainly became more noticeable during these events. After a year at Northwest Christian University, Michael transferred to a dual enrollment program. It was around this time that his loved ones began to notice his increasing marijuana use. Life took another turn for Michael when he dropped out of college and moved back in with his parents. He switched jobs frequently, working at various restaurants and bars. Like many young people, he wasn't yet sure what he wanted to do with his life and was just trying to find his place in the world. Eventually, he decided to venture out on his own, moving to the nearby town of Eugene. Unfortunately, this is where Michael's life took a turn for the worse. He fell into a bad crowd and began using meth. However, it's important to remember that this darker chapter does not define Michael's whole life. He was an extraordinary individual, a bright light in many lives and should be remembered for the good he brought into the world. He lived a normal life, much like you and I, and his struggles only served to humanize him more. His story is a stark reminder of the unseen struggles many face and how these can ultimately lead to tragic circumstances. Tragically, it seems that Michael's boundless compassion and empathy for others may have indirectly contributed to his descent into addiction. As stated on the Michael Bryson Foundation website, Michael participated in mission trips to Africa as a young adult. His aim was to help children receive education, health care, and learn about God's word. Yet these trips exposed him to traumatic experiences that even we, as adults, would struggle to comprehend. We believe this led him to rely on substance abuse as a means to cope with the horrors he witnessed. Michael's substance use continued for about eight months, during which things spiraled out of control. His parents were placed in the heart-wrenching position of having to cut off financial support until he sought help for his addiction. The fear of unknowingly enabling his substance abuse was too great. Loving someone battling addiction is a complex and painful journey. The line between helping and enabling is thin and often blurred. This chapter of Michael's life is a painful reminder of the devastating impact addiction can have, not only on the individual, but also on those who love them. The following month saw Michael wrestling with the decision to get clean. Finally, he was ready to accept treatment and his parents arranged for him to enter rehab in California. However, in a heartbreaking turn of events, Michael had a change of heart before they even left town. The situation reached a breaking point and his parents, Tina and Parrish, found themselves making an agonizing call to Tina's brother, a Eugene police officer. The arrival of several other officers marked a critical moment in Michael's life. In an effort to save Michael from himself, the officers proposed a drastic measure, arrest. Assured that Michael would only be in jail for a couple of days, Tina and Parrish consented. This led to Michael spending 22 days in jail, a period that forced him to detox. Upon his release, he was taken straight to rehab, where he spent an additional 22 days. This experience seemed to set Michael on the right path. He returned to using only marijuana and remained clean for the next two and a half years, However, as time passed, Michael began experimenting with other substances, and his life spiraled out of control once again. Despite the highs and lows, Michael maintained a close relationship with his family, never going more than two days without communicating with them in some way. It was clear that Michael dreamed of a better life. He considered joining an apprenticeship program to become an electrician, and even toyed with the idea of moving to California for a fresh start. It was clear that Michael so desperately wanted to break free from the cycle of substance abuse, but his dreams were ripped away when he disappeared on August 5th, 2020. There is a lot of conflicting information when it comes to the details surrounding Michael's disappearance. While we have done our best to sort through all the information, it is important we take this timeline with a grain of salt, and as always we urge you to do your own research and form your own opinion. As we delve deeper into the timeline of Michael's life, we come across a significant event that took place shortly before his disappearance. Michael was invited to an unconventional birthday party at the Hobo Campground area, east of Dorena Lake in Oregon. 
this campground is described as absolutely beautiful, but very remote. The remoteness of this area made it the perfect location for this unofficial rave. The planning for this event was extensive, lasting about a month, with attendees pooling resources to create a festival-like atmosphere. However, despite the effort put into organizing the event, there was no cover charge, nor was there hired security, an oversight that would later prove significant. Now, of course, one would not generally expect to see security at a regular party. However, with a gathering of this magnitude, things are bound to get out of hand. The guest list was estimated to be around 45 to 50 people, but the actual number of attendees was likely much higher due to friends of friends coming and locals joining the festivities. Michael was asked to DJ at the party, a task he happily accepted given his passion for music. Despite not knowing many of the attendees and his roommates urging to skip the party and help around the house instead, Michael was determined to attend this event he had been looking forward to for weeks and he didn't want to back out at the last minute. This party, filled with unfamiliar faces, holds significance in Michael's story. It was here, amidst the revelry and music, that Michael Bryson would be seen for the last time. As we backtrack a little to the hours before the fateful party at Hobo Campground, a significant piece of information comes to light. Just before Michael left for the party, he sent a text message to his ex-girlfriend, Natalie. The content of this text, in hindsight, sends chills down the spine. He expressed an unsettled feeling about the party, a weird premonition that something was amiss. His exact words, got a weird feeling that something's gonna go down tonight. When she asked what he meant, he said, I don't know, just an off feeling, or running into someone I'm not chilling with. Michael then seemed to reassure himself that nothing bad would happen because there would be a lot of people there. Natalie and Michael had a history that stretched back two and a half years. When the pair were introduced, it was an instant connection. Over time, their bond deepened, transforming from friendship to a romantic relationship. Although they decided to end their romantic relationship after nearly a year, they remained best friends, their bond unbroken. Natalie, wanting to respect Michael's space after their breakup, did not want to pry too much into his ominous message. However, she expressed her concern, wishing she knew more about the people he was attending the party with and the area he was heading to. She ended the conversation with a heartfelt hope for his safety and an expression of her love. This would be the last communication between Natalie and Michael. This scene serves as a chilling reminder of the sometimes overlooked significance of our gut feelings and how they can be a harbinger of things to come. As we delve deeper into the timeline leading up to Michael's disappearance, it's necessary to focus on the events of Monday, August 3rd. Michael made a visit to his parents' home that day, sharing his camping plans with his father and asking for some gas money for the trip. His father agreed to give him the money, on the condition that Michael help him with a few things around the house. During this conversation, Michael mentioned that he'd be out of cell phone service for a few days but reassured his father of his return expressing an intent to earn some extra money by helping his dad when he got back. After finishing the chores, Michael visited with his family for a bit before saying his goodbyes. What no one could have known at the time was that this would be the last time that they would see Michael Bryson. The party at Hobo Campground was a multi-day event with DJs scheduled from Monday afternoon until Wednesday. Michael planned to stay until Thursday, intending to catch a ride home then. He was also due to DJ at another event on the upcoming Friday, so he took his keys and thumb drive along, ensuring he could access his apartment and music for the show. However, a doctor's appointment for a shoulder injury delayed Michael's departure for the party. Originally, he was to ride to the campsite with the bus owners, but their early departure made him change his plans. Instead, he arranged to ride with a friend, Ben, someone his family vaguely knew. These were the mundane yet crucial details of the last days Michael was seen each moment unwittingly inching closer to the mystery of his disappearance. Michael and Ben set out for the hobo campground around 8.30 p.m. The dense forest combined with the darkness of the late hour led to them getting lost a few times along the way, and they considered turning back home. But the allure of the party and the promise of a memorable night drove them to persist. Finally, after two hours of navigating the winding roads and dense woodland, they arrived at the campsite around 10.30 p.m. Michael, knowing that he would not have cell signal, left his phone in Ben's car, which is where it would later be found. Michael and Ben found themselves in a lively atmosphere with two school buses turned into makeshift party venues, one which was set up as a stage with lights and speakers, 
a generator humming in the background, and a photo booth adding a whimsical touch to the wilderness. The campers had a variety of sleeping arrangements, from tents to vans and vehicles. However, the festive atmosphere was soon marred by a disturbing incident. Within half an hour of their arrival, a fight broke out. A woman from a nearby campsite became increasingly aggressive. Despite multiple attempts to pacify her and then eventually requests for her to leave, she continued to cause a scene, allegedly removing her clothes and shouting physical threats. The situation escalated to the point of physical altercation with the birthday girl. When she refused to leave after being physically removed, she threatened to retrieve a gun from her purse and return, a threat which is sure to leave chills running down anyone's spine. In her heightened state, she barged into a nearby RV, inhabited by sleeping campers unassociated with the party. There she began accusing a woman of sleeping with her husband, although the camper had no idea what she was talking about. The woman's irrational accusations and disruptive behavior frightened the RV's occupants so much that they decided to abandon the campsite altogether. This chaotic entry set the stage for what was to unfold in the following hours, leading to Michael's mysterious disappearance. As the sun rose over the Hobo campground on Tuesday, August 4th, between 10 and 10.30 a.m., the party was interrupted by an unexpected visitor, a ranger. It seems the official reason for his visit was a noise complaint, possibly filed from a campsite about a mile and a half down the road to the west. The loud music, which had been the lifeblood of the party, now stood as a potential reason for eviction. However, some have speculated that this may not be the true reason for the ranger's visit, Rather, there may have been a complaint from the occupants of the RV. Regardless of the real reason, the ranger's arrival marked a turning point in the party. Upon his arrival, the ranger threatened to confiscate the music equipment, although it was clear he would not physically be able to do so due to the sheer size and weight of the equipment. But what really caught the ranger's attention was the state of the campsite. The once serene wilderness had been transformed into a trash-filled party venue. Frustrated, and angered by the disregard for the campground, the ranger demanded that the partygoers pack up and leave. However, his command fell on deaf ears. The party, it seemed, was far from over, setting the stage for the tragic events that would follow. As the day progressed, the party continued on unabated. Alcohol flowed freely, and there were whispers of illicit substances being passed around. Michael, according to eyewitness accounts, was seen indulging in ketamine around 11.30 p.m. Amidst the revelry, a disturbing revelation came to light. Michael's wallet, which reportedly contained a significant amount of money, was missing from one of the buses. This part of the tale gets a bit murky. Some say Michael mentioned having $600 in his wallet, however he had recently repaid a $400 loan he had borrowed for his rent, which should have left him with only $200. It's unclear whether Michael had simply forgotten due to his intoxicated state or if maybe he had started the trip with more money than others were aware of. What's striking, however, is Michael's nonchalant reaction to the loss of his wallet. Despite the considerable sum and his own financial struggles, Michael allegedly didn't seem upset. This incident provides a glimpse into his mindset just hours before his disappearance. He was relaxed, in high spirits, seemingly unfazed by the loss. Speculations abound as to why Michael would bring such a large amount of money to a party where it served no real purpose. Some suggest it was intended to purchase drugs. Others believe he brought it solely to repay his rent loan. Others speculate he carried the money out of fear he might encounter someone he owed money to. But as the day turned into night, Michael's wallet remained missing and the state of his mind remained untroubled, setting the stage for the bewildering events that were yet to unfold. As the night descended, the party at Hobo Campground grew. At around midnight, Michael left the bus he was in as his friend Ben wanted to sleep. Not ready to retire, he hopped over to the other bus. Sometime during the night, a peculiar incident occurred. One of the partygoers went to go retrieve an axe from their camp area so they could cut wood for the campfire. However, the axe was missing as well as a saw. He was able to locate the items with another partygoer, who he was not familiar with, and got the items back without incident. It is unclear if this incident has any relevance to our story, but it will come up again later on. At around 12.30 a.m., a new party-goer arrived to find Michael in a distressing state. He was vomiting, sweating, and visibly unwell. It is alleged that at some point during the party, Michael had been puddled with LSD. Puddled is a slang term which can have a variety of meanings. It is generally used to describe the act of squirting a large amount of liquid LSD in someone's mouth. This is generally done with a dropper. 
the recipient often isn't aware of how much LSD they are ingesting and will become incoherent and no longer able to function, essentially turning into a puddle on the floor as the name suggests. The term generally refers to LSD, but can refer to other substances and even alcohol. Death from overdosing on LSD is rare. The deaths associated with LSD generally come as a result of accidents or actions while under the influence, not from the LSD itself. Even still, ingesting large amounts of LSD can have detrimental effects to the psyche. After receiving water and taking some time, Michael seemingly recovered. He even joined the DJs on stage at around 2 a.m. Around 3 a.m., more people arrived and Michael greeted them before settling down at a bus table for a chat. Again, we want to reiterate that these are the facts as they have been reported, but should be taken with a grain of salt. It was during this time that witnesses describe a significant shift in Michael's demeanor described almost as a state of psychosis. About an hour later, at approximately 4 a.m., Michael said something that surprised those around him. You guys don't want me here. After this, it is reported that Michael abruptly got up and walked off the bus, disappearing into the darkness of the night. One thing that does seem to conflict this account is that Michael's family has made it clear that he was absolutely terrified of the dark. They believe that no matter how high or drunk he was, he would not have willingly walked into the dark alone, especially in such a remote area. In the aftermath of Michael's puzzling statement, a cloud of uncertainty descended on the party. The terrain of the campground is notoriously treacherous, pretty much just straight up on both sides. Reportedly, no one saw which way Michael was headed, but considering he was wearing Crocs, it stands to reason that he most likely would have taken the road. However, if he really did wander off into the wilderness, this is unfortunately a bad place to do so. The area is reportedly full of miners and meth camps, both of which are notoriously protective of their territories. This information adds another layer of complexity to the mystery of Michael's disappearance. The moments following Michael's sudden departure were filled with confusion. Partygoers reportedly began their search for Michael within minutes of his disappearance. Several individuals took to the road driving up and down in hopes of spotting him. The terrain was challenging, and the darkness of the early morning hours was disorienting. Flashlights pierced the darkness as they called out for Michael, their voices echoing in the vast wilderness. The three DJs performing at the party were reportedly unaware of the situation unfolding. Their proximity to the speakers and the loud music could have easily drowned out the searchers' voices. It is unclear why the DJs were not alerted to the situation as they could have used their equipment to call out for Michael. However, the searchers hoped at the very least that the sound of the music would guide Michael back if he was lost. After being unable to locate Michael, they figured maybe he was just sleeping somewhere. He hadn't yet gone to sleep from the night before, so this seemed like the most logical explanation. There were people sleeping everywhere and combined with their intoxicated state, it was hard to distinguish if Michael was among these sleeping campers without waking them up. At approximately noon, Ben was woken up to the news that Michael had disappeared. If you remember, Ben is the friend that had given Michael a ride to the campground. This would have been approximately eight hours after Michael had disappeared, and despite the disconcerting situation, the campsite was eerily calm, with most people merely lounging around instead of actively searching for Michael. Ben took it upon himself to scour the area, but to no avail. Feeling helpless and cut off from the world, he decided to head back to town where he would have signal, and there he began reaching out to everyone he could think of, hoping someone might have seen Michael or given him a ride back to town. Unfortunately, all his attempts were fruitless, and so, with that, Ben contacted search and rescue and then headed back to the campsite. Meanwhile, back home, Michael's parents were going about their normal day completely unaware that anything was amiss. As the day went on, Michael's mother Tina was growing increasingly worried. She had sent Michael a text the previous night to check in and was concerned when she didn't hear back from him as this was unlike him. Around 11.30 a.m., she sent another text, jokingly saying, hey, are you alive? But as the hours ticked by without a response, her worry turned into fear, prompting her to send another text saying, Michael, this isn't funny. Contact me ASAP. Now, if you remember, Michael had stopped by his parents' house before leaving for the trip. He had let his father know he wouldn't have cell signal, but didn't mention it to his mother, so she was completely unaware of this fact. Regardless, his mother's panic after just a few hours of not hearing from Michael shows a clear pattern of behavior. Michael was close with his family and never went long periods without speaking to them. Her fear turned into panic when she received a message around 5 p.m., not from Michael, 
but from his ex-girlfriend Natalie, inquiring if Tina had seen or heard from Michael. Natalie revealed that Michael had been missing since 4 a.m. that morning, causing Tina's worst fears to become reality. Natalie, who hadn't been at the party, had received word of Michael's sudden and mysterious disappearance. As soon as Tina got the news about her son's disappearance, she was in a state of shock and panic. The thought that her youngest child had been missing for over half a day without her knowledge was a nightmare she never dreamt of. She immediately left her work, her mind filled with worry and fear. She contacted Parrish, Michael's father, to convey the horrifying news. She also reached out to her brother, a Eugene police officer, informing him of the dire situation. Tina, her brother, and Parrish began their desperate journey to the campsite. On the way, Tina dialed the local authorities to officially report Michael as missing. Michael's family arrived to the campsite around 7.15 p.m. At this point, the search and rescue team had already arrived based on Ben's earlier call. The partygoers were being questioned, and their information gathered. Tina and Parrish only recognized Ben amidst the crowd. Parrish approached the crowd, introduced himself, and spoke openly about his son's struggle with alcohol and substance use. He hoped that by doing so, the partygoers would open up and provide crucial details about Michael's activities during the party. He asked about the specific substances present at the party and those that Michael might have used, explaining his reason for asking such a sensitive question. He wanted to understand Michael's possible behavior under the influence which could help them in their search. But to his disappointment, the crowd did not seem interested in discussing anything related to drug use, leaving Michael's family with more questions than answers. It's important to remember that we do not know what was going through the minds of these campers. They may not have understood the gravity of the situation and could have thought that Michael would eventually come back. Looking at it that way, it's easy to see how they could have feared the consequences. This, of course, does not excuse withholding crucial information, but it does give us a glimpse at their possible mindset. At this point, it had gotten dark, and there was not much Tina and Parrish could do in the way of searching. As the sun rose on a new day, Michael's parents were joined by a rapidly growing search party. The urgency of the situation was palpable as more than 60 volunteers came together. Their common goal, finding Michael. Their hope fueled by the belief that Michael was still out there, waiting to be found. As they scoured the dense forest, the partygoers began to pack up, their laughter and joy from the previous night replaced by a somber silence. By the afternoon, the first bus left, and one by one the attendees trickled away, leaving the campground empty by Friday morning. It's hard to ignore such a blatant lack of regard. Michael's so-called friends packing up and leaving while he could still be out there, possibly hurt and in need of help. But thanks to the power of social media, news of Michael's disappearance spread like wildfire, and the search party tripled in size by Friday with over 200 volunteers showing up ready to aid in the search. Every day after that, between 100 to 150 people showed up ready to brave the challenging terrain. The search was intense, with drones, ATVs, boats, helicopters, scent dogs, cadaver dogs, and equestrians being brought in. Despite their best efforts and extensive grid searches, not a single sign of Michael was found. Every conceivable location was searched. Nearby rivers, lakes, creeks, roadsides, ditches, bridges, mines, and of course, the forest itself. Yet no sign of Michael was found. As the search for Michael intensified, his loved ones took to plastering the surrounding towns with missing person flyers, hoping to cast a wider net. This effort seemed to reignite hope when several tips came pouring in. People claimed to have seen Michael in Eugene, the town where he resided. Some of these leads seemed unconvincing, with the tipsters appearing unreliable, but others were credible, even identifying Michael by the outfit he was last seen in. However, each sighting had an alarming similarity. The man was described as being extremely out of sorts, barely functioning, and always accompanied by someone. This led to a theory that Michael was suffering from a severe drug-induced psychological break. While these sightings provided some relief that Michael was alive and not lost in the wilderness, they also instilled a deep sense of urgency. In response, a small group took to the streets of Eugene, distributing flyers and engaging with the local homeless community for any possible leads. A glimmer of hope emerged when they received a call from a good Samaritan claiming to have found Michael. The individual even declined the reward which added credence to their claims and a meeting at a local convenience store was arranged. However, this turned out to be a cruel hoax as the person never showed up and the phone number led to a dead end 
with the owner of the phone number claiming that a random man had walked up and asked to borrow their phone. Despite the setback, the search continued, with the family chasing down every possible sighting. Eventually, a photograph was obtained of the man seen around town believed to be Michael. But the hopeful lead crumbled when it was confirmed that the man in the picture was not Michael, delivering a crushing blow. The search took an unexpected turn back to the forest where Michael was last seen. His uncle, a police officer, discovered a bullet casing lying in the middle of the road about one to two miles from the campsite. A casing is the outer layer of the bullet, and as the name suggests, is essentially a case that holds all the components together. Once the ammunition has been shot, the empty casing is then ejected out of the gun. Interestingly, the casing was found near a glow bracelet, similar to those present at the party on the night of Michael's disappearance. Despite the area being littered with bullet casings from frequent gun use, this one stood out. It appeared fresh, as if it had been recently fired. The uncle, trained in evidence collection, carefully preserved the casing for further investigation. It is unclear what, if anything, came from this. The discovery sparked rumors, including one about a blood-stained casing being found. However, the family quickly dispelled these rumors stating the casing found did not have blood on it. It is unclear where this rumor originated from. Around the same time, a shirt was found 15 miles from the campsite, near a grange. It was stained with a substance initially thought to be blood. However, the family confirmed that the shirt did not belong to Michael, and further examination revealed the stain was not blood, but fecal matter. Meanwhile, the mystery took another twist. In speaking with Michael's father, one of the party goers mentioned speaking to three private investigators. This startled Parrish as the family had only hired two. After further inquiry, it was revealed that the third person was in fact the mother of another party goer, impersonating a private investigator. This startling revelation added another layer of intrigue to the already complex case. What would this woman gain by impersonating a private investigator? Was she trying to gain inside information? And if so, why? Our story takes an unexpected twist in October of 2020 when a significant message is received by the Bryson family. This message, whose contents have not been fully disclosed, is said to contain vital information about Michael's disappearance, the who, what, when, and where. While we would love to know more about this, the information is understandably being withheld for now. This momentous revelation appears to be the most substantial lead yet, prompting a shift in focus towards this new information. The person who sent the message comes forward the next day, providing more details and even some visual proof to substantiate their claims. It is at this point that a previously unmentioned group of people is brought into the narrative. This group, described as intimidating and sinister, allegedly arrived to the party changing the atmosphere completely. The party had been happy and carefree, but the vibe became heavy and dark. It is suggested that these individuals came specifically looking for Michael, leading to the suspicion that someone at the party had informed them of his presence. Given the remote location of the gathering, it seems unlikely that their arrival was mere coincidence. The investigation continues as we delve deeper into the perplexing details of Michael's case. On an ordinary day, December 7, 2020, a call comes through to Parrish, Michael's father. The caller is a local logger who had actively participated in the initial search for Michael. He has found something of interest on Bryce Creek Road, a location about 0.7 miles west of Hobo Camp. The logger, accompanied by his dog, had spotted something beneath some sort of foliage. Because of his involvement in the search, his mind immediately connects the find to Michael. The sheriff's office and search and rescue teams are notified and upon investigation, they confirm that the items found belong to Michael. What these items were is currently being withheld. However, the discovery in an area that had previously been combed through with grid searches multiple times raises several questions. In fact, Michael's family had been to this exact spot a few days prior to the discovery and are adamant that the items were not there at that time. This leads to the unsettling conclusion that the items could have been placed there after the initial searches. However, this theory is challenged by the condition of the items. They were weather-worn, muddy, and had begun to grow moss, indicating they had been exposed to the elements for a considerable period. The items were found next to a creek bed concealed beneath a bush or tree, and with the change in seasons from August to December, the visibility in the area would have improved significantly. This raises the possibility that the items might have been overlooked in the initial searches. However, several people are adamant that they searched this exact area on numerous occasions. 
The search for Michael Bryson has spanned months and even years, with countless man-hours poured into scouring the rugged Oregon wilderness. The story of Michael Bryson serves as a stark reminder of the countless stories that remain unresolved, hanging in the balance between hope and despair. As the search continues and the years roll on, one can only hope that answers will eventually surface, bringing closure to these haunting tales of those who have vanished without a trace.